Hello, everybody. Once again, I remain Jason Alexander here with my... The box that Peter Tilden came in. Yeah, the Peter, Peter Tilden. Tilden, yes. And this is the, uh, the, the podcast the longer... you've come to know and love called... <laughs> really? No, really. really. And it's funny because when we started this, however many episodes ago, we were best friends and I used to push that. Now, it's really diminishing. <laughs> it's diminishing I never, with and every I never podcast. Said, I never said best friend. And you know why? Because you're a coward. You wouldn't admit that we're best friends because you would alienate your I don't want to alienate my other friends. I knew it. That's right. How many other friends do you have to alienate? And by the way, what are we, three? When you're, when you're on the playground, you have a best friend. Oh, okay. That hurt. What? Who's? I'm who not looking it? at camera saying, now the, the humor is not humorous anymore. What? But that, seriously. Let's move on. Really? No, really. Really? No, really. Really? Stop clowning around. There's your segue. There's your segue. Because today what we're talking about, we, we started to do some research on the world's most dangerous jobs. And one of the number one, if not the number one, in a lot of the rundowns on it was human cannonball. And I, I called Peter and I said, Peter, you, you know what the most dangerous job is? I don't know how we're going to do this. It's being a human cannonball. And Peter said, one of my best friends <laughs> is a human, human cannonball. And I said, what do you mean, best friend? And I said, really? 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 No, no really. really. So you will get to meet, if you've never seen somebody who gets shot out of a cannon at 70 to 75 miles per hour, goes over 200 feet. Yeah. The, I think one of the highest heights that have been shot, 75 feet. I yeah. Think, think 75 this, feet up, 200 uh, feet out. But I think our guy goes about 30, 35 feet up. But what's interesting about this. Oh, then really, we didn't get the guy. <laughs> I think we, that guy. We didn't get the I think, guy. I think <laughs> the human cannonball first entered the public consciousness in the 19th century, Jason, 1871. Wow. An English man named George Farini. Can you imagine other people are working on other stuff and yeah. he's trying to shoot people? Somebody's out. trying to come up with a car. Yeah, what are you work, what's your husband George working on? <laughs> Shooting people out. Right of the brothers cannon. are trying to fly. <laughs> Don't tell the cousins yeah, right. that you're okay. So George Farini developed the mechanism he called a projector made out of heavy springs. Indian rubber, it was simply a platform with springs, looked nothing like a cannon, but when released, it shot a person or whatever. Now, could you imagine? Or whatever. Because George was, I'm sure, <laughs> trying to convince the first person sure. that George knew what he yeah. was doing. Yeah. Um, he applied and received a patent in June 13th, 1871. Two years later, 1873, the projector made its first appearance to the American public um, due to his own girth, however, he couldn't fit in it. That's what he said. Yeah, I'm not going in. <laughs> I'm there. not going in that thing. You could have made the two bigger, George. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. No, that's madness. Uh, it, it was not himself, but Lulu, a petite young man dressed in women's clothing. Sure. Already. Sure. Already with the... Yeah. Um, he trained Lulu. Yeah. And when George let go... He trained the latch, Lulu? Trained Lulu. What was, what was that training? <laughs> Here, stand on this. Get in, get You're trained. Tour. Get in the <laughs> Get in the tube already. But there's months of coaching. You had to put a meal. You had to, you had to beat them senseless like in order to get them to go in the tube. You that was the training. food in there. You right. Say, yeah. <laughs> let them sleep in there. And then one day you just shoot it off. When George let go of the latch holding the spring, Lulu shot 30 feet into the air and grabbed the bars. <laughs> Much to Lulu's surprise. <laughs> and grabbed the bars of a trapeze hanging down from the ceiling. Sure. Crowd went wild. George and I mean, they did it in a crowd. We're going to do this first time. Might as well. Might if you're going to well. go. Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Why waste it? George and Lulu were hit and took to the road with their circus act. By 1875, <laughs> Lulu was known as the queen of trapezes. Sure. But their act would be eclipsed by a new invention in the human projectile history. A guy named George Loyal in Australia uh -huh. also did this thing and catching and shooting up into the air and sure. the whole bit. So that it has a real, real history of this. And I actually... Um, was working, I think it was PM Magazine in Philly a long time ago. And I was, one of my segments was to join the circus for a night and go to Clown College, an abbreviated version of Clown College. You went College. to Clown College? Abbreviated. They did it in Philadelphia at the time. Because mm. um, Clown College, you, you have to apply. I don't it. see you in a Clown College, I've got to tell you. I don't see it. I don't get well, it. Well, I had low SAT, so it was tough. Um, but I think I could have. You put, you put clown white makeup on that face? So I met, I met this next guy who you're going to meet. Yeah. He was a clown assigned to me. Yeah. He made me up, taught me clowning, and I was in the center ring of Ringling Brothers. And he ran around and hit well, me with now, a giant. Now I know why Ringling Brothers went under. Okay, go ahead. He hits me with a giant powder puff. Yeah. And I'm the act. And we have stayed friendly from night. We, we just talked about it 37 years. He's traveled with his family. Um, and John started out as a clown with Ringling Brothers. 
and then progressed. And he called me one day, so proud. He said, guess what I'm doing now? I said, what, John? You're the head clown? He said, I'm getting shot out of the cannon. And I went, really? you're an idiot. <laughs> really? No and way. with that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Mr. Weiss. Mr. John Weiss, the human, one of the few human cannibals, right, in the world. Yeah, I was very fortunate. I was able to uh, jump in there and <laughs> yeah. shoot out. You're for, fortunate. fortunate's a, a word. Break, That's a break. choice of a word. Lucky, lucky break. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, you were you were a circus clown, and I know that applying to clown college, Jason's joking about that, but like five, six thousand people apply, and they only pick like thirty or forty, right? Yeah, they hold the auditions throughout the United States, and the professional clowns, when we're in a particular location. We bring the people in the ring. We audition them. We do all kind of improvisational stuff. But we're really looking to see how they feel in front of the audience, you know, how they move, how they take directions. And then what they do is they get all about five to 6,000 people, and they select only 60 to go through the clown program. And I was one of 60. How long is it? And how long is clown college? It was almost two months when I went. And do they charge for the college? It's tuition-free, but you. This is, I'm glad you brought this up because... Um, it is tuition free, but you need about $1,500 back in 81. We didn't have the money. And my, my, my mom's boss was deathly afraid of clowns. So when I was doing amateur clowning, she said, don't let your son come in here and make up. <laughs> and I, and I never went in. So my mother's on the phone saying, John has this opportunity. I don't know what we're going to do because I don't have the $1,500. And the next day there was a check on her deck. From him. But wait, if there's no tuition, what, 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 was that to just pay to, your room and board? I was going to say. Okay, and food. So for your expenses. Yeah, yeah, food, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. yeah, if the clown fails, they're out for room and board. And by the way, if you fail, they right, you get the hit sad. in the face with a pie enough times, so you can't you subsist. You do the way. sad clown face if you fail, I guess. Right. So, and they teach you everything. And John, you know what's funny? I never thought of this, Jay. I've known John. We stayed, I stayed in touch with his family. We just became like, like a second family all these years. And this is going to sound weird, but you are very similar in that when you hit the stage, I, I said this on some show the other day. As much as we cut each other up, Jason's a powerhouse when he gets on stage. It's, di it's dynamic. It's dynamic. You're overstated. Finish John, your thought. Finish John, your thought. John, John went from clowning where you had to command the audience. And you yeah. never think of that as commanding, but you're in a or center ring at Madison sure. Square Garden. But John, I've seen John then. He was the ringmaster and the kind of thing. John's that guy. He comes out on stage and he's got so much personality. He, when I met him, mm -hmm. try and lift a shopping cart. You know how heavy a shopping cart is? Yeah. It's impossible. John was juggling a shopping cart and balancing it on his chin. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't lift it up. You can hardly return it when you're done shopping. You don't know, That's man. It. I can lift a shopping cart. No, you cannot. I can lift a shopping cart. Laurie, in a future episode, we'll get a spo sponsor, of course, whichever supermarket. Are you going to get some sort of crazy... No, know? no. I, I, I'll have Laurie pick the random shopping cart. I want to go There's to nowhere. Ralph's supermarket on, on the corner of 3rd. So we get two sponsors. <laughs> We get a supermarket sponsor and somebody to do the hernia, the hernia surgery. <laughs> John, what is this? What's a what's a cart way? I don't know. I, I use a Costco shopping cart. Yes, that's what I want. A Metal. Costco shopping Metal, cart. Metal, yeah. Yeah. I, I just heavy is better for me. You're not gonna Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. I'm me too. <laughs> <laughs> he also you also like an idiot. I mean, this used to drive me crazy. But you, you would balance but not just the shopping. I saw photos of you <laughs> you balance a, a dollar bill on your chin, you balance a feather on your chin. And you, also a I mean, running chainsaw. And a running chainsaw. I can do that, too. I, can do that. <laughs> I want to see that one. And by the way, if you'd like to apply for the co-host position. <laughs> no, it's, you know, I just started as a kid balancing stuff. Didn't know I had the talent. And then as I got older, people would challenge me to balance bigger things. Right. And that's how I got to climb. And college. was it always, now, <laughs> this is such a stupid question. The, with the balancing, with, did you always on the chin or did you like try on a finger or top No, no, of I started head on or? my foot. On your foot. And then it got to my knee, my shoulder, and then my face. Uh-huh. Heavy objects on the chin, yeah. light on the nose. You know what we sure. do have to do? We'll get John to send us some photos that we can we can insert because they're, it's insane. He you know, I've seen some one of those giant there. ladders, the, the tallest ladder yeah, you've yeah, ever yeah. seen, and he's got. An and Clay, I'm also, I'm kidding. No, I'm sure, I'm sure I cannot lift a shopping cart. <laughs> Maybe 30 you know years what? ago, I could lift. Jason a shopping Jason can't cart. Un get it out of the other shopping right, cart that's to shop. Right. That's, that's, that's that already hard. Correct. So you went from clowning, and the interesting thing for me about clowning. Because I was around the circus, go to John. I got to spend a lot of time and see the circus trains. It's it's an amazing culture there, but clowning there is a caste system in the circus, and most of the acts are generational, and they're very protective of the act. They don't want, they don't want to give away secrets. So here's this here's a clown who wants to all of a sudden learn how to do that. I read somewhere, I read a lot of articles, even though I know you a long time, that there may have even been sabotage 
Yeah. Or as Bill Shatner says, sabotage. sabotage. There you go, sabotage. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> is that true, John? That how hard was that to break into a family traditional business where the circus treats those people like God? That's they're the big stars. Well, it starts at different levels. Like you have supposedly it did at one point. It was all the act people, and then you had clowns and showgirls at a different level. So we were never at that level. To get to that level, you, you were usually, you know, within your family, you know, years and years of training. Right. And that training, as you said, went down to the next generation. Right. And that would give them longevity in the business. Me, on the other hand, the, the cannon was owned by Kenneth Feld, the owner of the circus. So there was two people shooting out. One guy didn't like it, decided he didn't want to do it. <laughs> wait a minute. How long was he? He was only one well, year. Can you, it was just, wait, at wait. the end of the year, he went, no. you know what? I've been thinking. <laughs> no, you know I what? I don't I'm, like this. You know what I'm wondering? <laughs> Like you've been in jobs where you go halfway, halfway through. I don't like it. Yeah. How much longer after the I don't like it point did he yeah. still have yeah. to yeah. shot yeah. on the yeah. Several hundred shows. I, yeah. He was always getting hurt every day. Every day, it's oh my god. He yeah. was getting hurt. He's and and what he used to the yell the as he flew through there was <laughs> under protest. <laughs> I hate this. Oh my god, he used to get hurt because he was when he was tense. He was also mad. <laughs> well, yeah. Was, Screw you. He was upset. It was over a bet. But John, wait. I want to go back. So wait, wait. It's so, over a bet. For a bet was he was a teeterboard artist. They were both they were both teeterboard artists, and the one guy was training and and was a backup for the other cannonball, and so he bet the other guy if we build a double cannon, you got to be the other guy, and he lost the bet, and the next year he was the other guy, and he kept getting hurt. And he never liked it. He how, was did like, that, how did you become a human cannonball? I lost the bet. Well, also, I love what it was on your resume. Backup cannonball. Backup cannonball. <laughs> By the way, no, not even, I'm not good call. enough to be the cannonball. No I'm the offense backup to cannonball. John, but the better of you would have been the guy who lost the right, bet. Yeah, lost right. the bet. But wait, I want to go back. I want to go back one. Be before we get into the cannonball, I'm still, I'm still on the clown thing. So are, are you suggesting, and is this true, so people would sabotage the clown acts? Uh, not really the clown acts. He, I think he's referring to the cannon. Because oh, when I started, because you were now yeah. jumping into the act, the world of the act, right? And it was, and you uh, hadn't earned it in their eyes. Is well, it wasn't up to him to make that decision because the counter was owned by Kenneth, right? The Felds, right? right? So they uh -oh. said, John, we're gonna we're gonna give you the opportunity to try that. Ooh, ooh. And I didn't know I was could do it, but all I knew is I had twenty six clowns behind me, rooting me on. Yeah, you know, by to the way, say, nothing feels better. Than having twenty six clowns supporting, <laughs> and it, it was so dangerous, oh, man. Everyone was making no. fun of everything. I'm like, guys, you got to chill out, man. Yeah, Let yeah. me do this once. I didn't even shoot out when once. When you have Jason, when you have twenty six clowns behind, a lot of honk, eh, 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 you hear the honking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such support, right, juggling. Sure. So the sabotage, sabotage. What did they do, or what do you think they did? Well, in, in retrospect, when I when I go back and I look at everything, when I train people, I give them distance to realize where they're going and to react in time to tuck and, and hit the net on their back or their shoulders. Right. When I was trained, it was right over the net. And I only <laughs> went like, like 10 feet. Uh -huh. And I knew after that first cannon shot, I was going to be able to do it because I tucked in time. Right. But I did hurt myself. What, the hurt, first what, got time. Hurt, what got hurt? My back was killing me, man. Because the distance between the seat and where you stand, because you're standing like this and you're locking every muscle... That that distance between the seat and your floor, if it's not right, you take too much in your in your in your buttocks, in your back. And if not, you take too much in your knees and your knees buckle and you hit the inside of the cannon. It's oh, a lot of Can you talk slower? Because people at home are taking notes if they want to do the cannon correctly. Well, this is but you know, the, you're you're answering the question, which is one of the one of the funniest Jerry Seinfeld routines ever. He was talking about the guy who on That's Incredible would catch bullets in his teeth. And Jerry makes the joke about how do you learn that? You know, what's, do, you, do they start by throwing the bullet and then they go, all right, Phil, this is coming in a little faster. I mean, how, so like the first time you get in the cannon, so, the, so the amount of, of throw from the cannon is relatively little because it's only going to, as you say, shoot you about 10 feet. But it gives you enough of the sense of, oh, okay, I see what this is going to build up to and I have to. So is the learn, do, did it gradually add more and more distance and therefore more and more? Thrust? Thrust, yeah. I mean, look, no matter what, when the cannon goes off, it's like a blink. If you blink your eyes, that's how fast it is. Jesus. So even a short shot is a, a huge jolt on your body. It's like being in a car accident and you're parked and somebody hits you from about 65 miles an hour, but you're that's ready insane. for it. Yeah. And that's the kind of force. We're talking about between 10 and 12 G-forces in a split second. So in, in, in pictures, when I see myself in pictures, I'm away from the cannon like 15 feet. My eyes are open. I don't remember any of that. And it's true, I don't, because the force is so great. So getting back to the beginning stages of training, yeah. 
you have to be aware of your, your surroundings and what you're doing when you're flying because you're actually flying and you're maneuvering your body to, to, right. to, to fly and bring your legs over your head to land on your back. The great thing about videotaping, you can go back. If I was training you, Jason, and I said, Jason, okay, look as long as you can and tuck your, tuck your head at the last minute. And you tell me, I've seen everything. I've seen the net and everything. Yeah. And when you go back to the video, they're tucking their head like a third of the way. So you're coming in blind the whole way into that net, and that's where serious injury is going to happen. Oh. So you got to be – can you see the crowd when you're flying? No. Have I can see flashes of lights, and I can hear, hear the wind going, shh. Have you blacked out? Never. But people do. I, if you black out, I don't know how – You're gone. I don't know how you're, you're gone. But that's you're, what I heard you're from really some of these bad. people. You're what not, is – nah. on your average flight, what's the difference on, on the average flight? You like, mean like a regular flight? Yeah, if you were doing it. It's three know. seconds, about 165 feet, under 35 feet high. Okay, so 165 feet. In three seconds. Right. And it's only 35 feet high because the, the rigging is trimmed out at 42. Wow. So as your legs come over, right, you want to make sure that you obviously don't clip your legs on the rigging. Oh, my God. So it's, and, it, and, and psychologically, when you're in there, you don't see the net. Yeah. All you see is the rigging. So psychologically, when the building is lower than 42 feet at trim, and you're trying to, you know, yeah. bring the cannon down lower for a line drive, psychologically, that first shot really can do a lot of damage to so, you. So, as you say, much like uh, I, I understand uh, parachutists do, you know, they w before they open the chute, there any little movement, hands, foot, head, alters how they fly. You're doing the same thing, but you're doing it, it must be completely instinctual because you can't there's no time to process mm -hmm. oh i need to i need to get a little <laughs> to the right memory. i mean gotta it's got to be, gotta gotta be, be muscle memory. it's doing it, it on auto sort of on an autopilot not to make a pun but i i i trained one clown and the reason i picked him because when we used to run out from the back curtain onto say the floor of the garden madison square garden we're yeah. running out as clowns like like 20 of us i would trip him as he's in a full run and he was able to roll out of it so I said, okay, he's got, his instincts, he got are, there, instincts are good. And his weight was proper because when you're shooting double, the weight difference between the two people oh is crucial oh because God. otherwise it's like a trampoline. You can bounce out of the net. If you hit the same time. Oh, There's God. a lot of stuff going on. Did you on ever there. do a tandem? Excuse me? Did no. you do tandem? Tandem? With, four with, four with, different with, people. With two, what? Four different, four different people. people. I four. trained three different guys. And so you, would you all four go at the same time? No, no. But, did, but did you two shoot in tandem time. with another guy? The longevity for a human cannibal, most people don't want to do it for a long period of time. Really? Yeah. That's, that's, just, that's <laughs> shocking. I would imagine that's, you know. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you this, too, because I used to see Laura, his wife, taught school. Yeah. She'd be backstage. This is amazing. All these little chairs in a circle. She's teaching the kids. She's already in her sugar office. And I would watch her go, hold on, kids. I'll be right back. She would walk through the curtain, do the fuse shoot him off, and go back and teach the kids. And how many times a day did you do this? Well, we did it about 10 to 13 times a week, <laughs> three times every Saturday. Three times every Saturday. And there was a year that we did, we produced the show with the cannon open in the show. That was the worst. Because like a 10 o'clock show, you'd be shooting out of a cannon. Horrible, man. Do you you're not with, do you you're trying to that's, that's worse than Peter stealing my A hundred percent, at least. <laughs> wow. Do you, do you, and I'm not saying this to be funny. Jason, before he goes on stage, I always say around four o'clock. Have you? Have you? Done, I, ha done? I, I have. Uh, I had a terrible incident on stage one time where I was in desperate need of a of a bathroom and and held on, thank God. But it was touch and go. So I go. Uh, I'm on. I'm on empty when I when I perform on them. I'm, I'm on guessing empty would be better. But, empty is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, empty is better. Yeah, at seventy miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But you know, but, but speaking of that, not only as the cannibal, but as a clown as well. You know the word. I, I know what it's like having to go on stage as an actor when you have a headache or you're feeling a little under or or something's happened in your life and you're upset and you know to, to focus to be a clown first of all, which is just pure entertainment. There's no plot to hide behind. There's no story. There's no lines. Pure, you know, pure joy entertainment. And then the risks of doing this. If you're feeling off, do you do it anyway? Do you, do you just go, I got it's, it's showtime. Show must go on. It, it, show must go on, always. Always. Yeah, you know, look, the audience is medicine for me. If uh -huh. I'm not having a good day, 
I get on stage and everything goes away because I'm connecting with an audience. Uh -huh. And I'm getting automatic feedback from what I'm doing and I'm having a good time. I create memories. Yeah. That's what we do as entertainers. We create memories. And to be a part of someone's memory for the life, yeah. forever, is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah, I don't get that. I don't get the necessarily the, the joy thing, but I get what we call in, in my side of the business, we call it Dr. Footlights. So I, I worked with a man who was in his 70s, you know, and had, you know, he was crushing around off stage. <laughs> He'd get on stage, all of a sudden he's Douglas Fairbanks. <laughs> he's, you know, the peak of health. And the minute he walks off that stage, boom, right back to, you know. And it's and he would call it Dr. Footlights. You know, the yeah. minute I step out Even there. Even for the canon. It just happened. Did you, I never yeah. saw you, when I was talking about Laura lighting it, I never saw you test the thing. Did you test it with dummies? The only, <clears throat> this is the thing, a lot of people make mistakes and have made mistakes in it. It cost them dearly. Uh, there was a gentleman... His name was uh, Elvin Bell. He was doing the cannon before I did on mm -hmm. Ringling. And in Japan, he uh, used a dummy to test the distance, and that dummy absorbed water. And it wasn't weighed prior to shooting out. Mm -hmm. Moisture, whatever it may have been, right? Change the weight. And he overshot the airbag. And oh, my. This was in front of an in, audience, right? Yeah, he landed in like uh, bleachers or seats or something. Oof. And he got paralyzed from it. And that was during the time I was training. So then I was questioning whether I was doing the right thing, but I was steadfast on my decision to, to learn this and achieve it and to become the best I could. But the whole, it wasn't just the, the I mean, if you look around, everything in the circus it seems dangerous to me. If you're on a wire, if you're on a trapeze, if you're working with an animal, if you're, I mean, the whole thing is, and the way, the, you know, especially with something like wrinkle, wringling, the whole rigging goes up like in a blink, comes down in a blink. I, it all seems very, very precarious to me. <laughs> uh, true, false? Well, you know, look, it's it's just like anything. If you lose respect for a, a fast car or motorcycle and you don't take the precautions necessary, there's always going to be something that's going to happen from someone else's you know, point of view, from driving. It, or With the Canon example, it's mechanical, so anything can happen. So you can't take anything for granted. Every show is different, and every show you have to take that time to make sure everything's right. Yeah. And I, I did overshoot a couple of times, but but side by side, I was only two weeks into the double cannon, and I was not in charge. And when I got inside of it, we didn't have an intercom system in there. We didn't mm. even have a safety. Oh, so once I got in there, they started the countdown, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to, oh, oh, my. Gonna. You knew something was wrong already? Absolutely. I was in the same level oh. as the next guy. Oh, the cannon should so have been the cannon, break the, when the, when the cannons go oh, back. So you'd come out this, at the same time. We're coming out at the same time, but same the height. strength on each one of them is different. So we land in different parts of the net. Oh. So at this point, when I get in, it's usually staggered, the capsules, right? right? I get in with side by side. And you can't I look see over, anything. I can see him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And by then, it's too late. So what happened? You, you brace and you, you pray and you're, oh, I got to hit the net, you know? And afterwards, did you get off, smile for the crowd, and then go scream at somebody? No. I'm not about that, but what I did was I made sure every show I checked it after that. But that one time could have killed me. It could have killed him. We could have bounced out of the net. We went side by side, landed in the same part of the net. We got up, and you could see our faces. I have it on video. You could see our faces, and we're like, oh, my God, we're alive. Oh, my God. So did the Zachary, is it the Zaccarini family that was around with you, or, which, or, the, or the Smith? They're the two big families, I think. Or the Smith family is the best in business. So did they accept you finally after you did it, or, or did it take time? Or were you never accepted? Well, you know the thing is when you go into a major act, like the Cannon, High Wire, Trapeze, Tito, whatever the traditional circus acts are, that when, you, when you're a clown or somebody at a lower level, that's, that my family was never in the business. I'm first generation. But I respected the business so much that I was really, I had the desire to do this, and I really wanted to do it. So would I put the time in? Would I commit to it? And could I do it? Was the question all the performers were asking, and I did. And then I gained their respect over time. So you are friendly with the Smiths? Oh, yeah. I, got it, I, got it, I don't even know if you know this, Jason. This was an oh, wow for me, because I don't believe it. This is the Zaccarini family, who are also big. They actually proposed, the Zaccarinis proposed in the past to government, our government agencies as a more efficient way to send soldiers into battle and as first responders into disaster areas, um, Zucchini said, the patriarchs proposed to the Italian government his idea of propelling people over enemy lines yep. using his recently designed human cannon. In 2006, the ideas were published by the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency 
to utilize a human cannon type mechanism to send first responders like firefighters or the U.S. Coast Guard into fire and flood disaster areas. Okay, so I can already see. All right, men. <laughs> now, when you get into the fire, you're going to be surrounded by flame. There's going to be dry. There's going to be heat. There's going to be sweat. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, no, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And to get you in there, we're going to stuff you in a tube and shoot you over the enemy. <laughs> And by the way, Excuse make sure you're... I'm sorry, what? Make sure you're... What? Axe, you're going to do what now? Hold the axe low and <laughs> <Yeah>. your hand... <laughs> right. And for God's sakes, don't bend your knees, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Here I come into the disaster area. That's, by the way, that's the way I would like to enter a disaster area. Right. Is anybody concerned about this axe on my back? Is anybody... Is that a problem as we go shooting? What is happened in the disaster? <laughs> Our relief killed seven people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was standing there putting out a forest fire and a guy landed took on me. Took out five families. <laughs> took, took out five families. So, so you ended up giving up giving up the thing and retiring from the circus. But the circus, Jason and I were talking about it yesterday when we were preparing. I think I read that Vegas is the second largest clown community next to the retirement community in Florida. Ringling Brothers? I believe it is. Yeah, is we just did an article about that and how many ex-Ringling people are out here, especially clowns. Because we get together at the first of the month. We get together as Ringling Clowns and we get together and we all have lunch and we share stories and you could just imagine what that's like. I was going to say, <laughs> stop juggling your food. <laughs> you know, oh my God, yeah. You know, so we, we share stories. Mean, John's balancing a rib on his chin again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great that you got to support community as well. Yeah, which is fortunate, you know, like, um, you know, I've had some crazy times in the last year. So my circus community, especially my clown community, has really, really support. reached out and really been supportive. And I was saying we have a lot of aunts and uncles in, in our family, yeah. but none of them are blood related. But that don't make a difference. It's the time you put into it. Sure. It was an amazing time to, be, to share that with no. you and watch the circus uh, and be on the circus train, which was insane, and be exposed to all of that. Was yeah, I mean, and John, to your, to your knowledge, is that, I mean, I know you're not part of the Cirque world, but you know, Cirque has four or five, six shows happening in this town. Is the modern circus family sort of the same thing? Did they, did, are they sort of a community the way you guys were, or, or I, is it more corporate now? Well, it's more corporate, 100%. Yeah. It, there's a community. But you got to remember, we lived and worked together. Right. Yeah. So we would get together at night and have barbecues, and everybody would bring a dish, and, and all, all the different kids at different right. levels, and we were with our kids all also the time. Also different backgrounds, different, different countries. You had, yeah. you had the, the glo a global community there. Well, that's true now, it was too. Pretty you nice. go to a yeah, search show, that's from all over that's the true. world. Yeah, and, you know, it was different. You know, we were individuals. You know, we, yeah. we brought our individual talent to, to the stage or to the ring, and, you know... All I want to do is, is do the best job I can and create a great memory for people that come to the show. I miss doing that. I do corporate events and stuff like that. But I, I take every opportunity I can to, to entertain a person or a kid. Like I'll balance a dollar bill, say, on my nose, and I'll videotape it for, for say, with a production crew. You have two kids. I, I acknowledge the kids' names. I balance it. I give the dollars to them. They bring them home to their kids. They watch the video. Then they watch the video on YouTube of what I really do. And it's very impacting for kids. Cameo, are you listening? Cameo, <laughs> John Weiss. Have him down to dollars. Right. I can do it right here in my seat. Go, go ahead. Down. He's going to do it right We're now. For those right now, listening. ladies and gentlemen, for those on YouTube. We'll narrate. We'll I don't know narrate. if they can catch There's a little I, draft in here from the air conditioning. <laughs> I know, so, it's a uh, problem. You know. yeah. If you could shoot yourself up? out of something too Stand today. up, sure, okay. go ahead. Could you shoot yourself out of something today too? That'd be fun. <laughs> good for us. Good for, good for viewing. Good promotion. Here we go. Here we go. John Weiss, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's windy, yeah. There we go. He's back. Good he's God. There he Good goes. He's God. Oh, wow. Look at that. Good <laughs> God. That's fa Oh. <laughs> God, nice, lady. Oh, Thank you. I love you. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad you got to meet uh, one of my friends. Not my best friend, uh, but one of my friends. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. And my Kidding coffee me. stealer. Yeah. I, I would never do that. I mean. <laughs> I know. Oh, you know what? I used to like you for 30 years. I, I really, it's, a, it's an honor to, to be on the show. It's great. My whole family sends their regards. They, I mean, they grew up with John. I, we're looking for a picture of Ben. You know how old Ben is? Yeah. At age three, getting made up by John in the parking lot. So 30 plus years ago. It was wow. pretty, yeah, pretty amazing. Thank wow. you, John. Thank you for having Love me. Thank you, you brother. And, uh, you by the way, the, the Five Five and Under Club salutes us. <laughs> 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 Apparently, I'd be good cannon fodder is what I'm oh, saying. You, well, I think... Uh, I think uh, what? what? What, Peter? Nothing. Perfect. What? 40 pounds. Anyway, so... Oh! Uh, <coughs> 40 pounds. My so, gosh, all right. You know, I, I just... Just put, add a little water to the dummy first, and you know we'll fly the same distance. You know what's weird? I just reverted back to radio. I just was ready to go, <laughs> we'll be back right after this. And then I realized, we're not going, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> all right, pretty amazing, right? And you got to meet my friend. And he's an old friend of yours. Here's, here's why I say that. Because I know... <laughs> I notice... 
you know, actors hang, hang out with actors, construction workers hang out with construction workers. People who take risks and do dangerous things don't tend to hang out with... Guys who don't cross double lines? Yeah, and play, but to, but yeah that's what I'm saying. So John was an unusual thing. We didn't hang a lot because we were touring, but we stayed close yeah. for 30 plus years. But to your point, Danger seekers don't hang with milk toast no. guys who go. I got up too fast. Because what would you do together? I, how do I go, how do I have a guy who free climbs you know Mount Everest and I go? You want to play uh, gin rummy for an hour? He's not. That's not lighting not, his fire. Like, and also, I'm guessing that any danger seeker didn't grow up with a mother who constantly said, "Don't overheat." Oh no! You know what? You know what? My mother don't overheat. Called. There's a reason I can't get on a skateboard. I can't do it. I can't get on a skateboard because I, I hear you. my mother's voice. You know, for, to this day, get off that goddamn thing! I, I <laughs> what are you crazy? <laughs> You're gonna break your head! I can't. I, I even you if I do can any ride culture, a skateboard, no culture surfing. If they said to me, I had to learn to roller skate for a Broadway show. I had never been on roller skates. If they had said it's a skateboarding show, I go, uh, I'm out. I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> my mother, uh, my mother okay, won't so let me. I got, we, we can do this back and forth. Ready? <laughs> I want to do try surfing. There are things in the water that can kill you. Right. Done. So oh, that's absolutely. out. That's absolutely. And, and by the sure. way, not the least of which, bacteria. Yeah. So that's <laughs> so even swimming was potentially not. not and a, God forbid you had something to eat before you went swimming. Oh, a meatloaf? Oh, you can't oh, go until June. Right. Yeah. Until June. So that was my whole childhood was being afraid. Were you made to be afraid of every, everything, by the way? No. Uh, uh, no, I wasn't. And my father was one of these guys who went, you know, I was, I was the kid that was bullied. My father's solution was go up to the biggest one, punch him right in the face. I went, I can't even reach the biggest one's face. I'd need a step stool to punch that That was that my brother. That was my brother. Uh, no, that my, my, my parents were sort of more of the go for it, but they had things that, that you just, and I'm not kidding about the skateboard. My mother once caught me trying to learn how to ride a skateboard and screamed at me, get off that goddamn thing. Crazy, crazy person. My mother, well, the, <laughs> well, don't overheat is the umbrella. <laughs> For, running, jumping, jump. Why would you jump rope? Why are you jump rope? Yeah, where are you going? Go read. <laughs> Go read. Yeah, where are you going? What are you, where are you going? You know when you get an hour jumping rope? More yeah. jumping rope. Why right. would you do that? Absolutely. So they basically undercut any risk taking. And I was not going to yeah. grow up to be the line, Wichita lineman. You no. know what you mean? And in my, in the, and we should talk about, because there are other dangerous jobs, but in the course of my career, very rarely have I done anything dangerous. Roller I, skating, I once roller did, skating. Well, I had to learn to roller skate. What play was it? For that? an audition, it was called The Rink. And, and I had to learn, and I'd never been on them in my life. My mother life. didn't go, don't, what are you doing? And I, and I lived on 2nd, I lived on 1st Avenue and 88th Street. And there was a, a, a skate rental store on 2nd Avenue where you had to give them your shoes in order to rent the skates. So I now have skates on. I have no shoes. My only, I'm either barefoot no or I'm in There's skates. No backup, right. And I'm trying to get up to Central Park because there was an area. It was the 80s. So the guys would be up there with the boom boxes. And I'm crawling. I'm holding lampposts and car fenders, crawling uphill to try and get to Central Park on these roads. But I was, offered, I was offered a role in the Broadway musical Starlight Express. Because that's all on roller skates. They're all playing trains. Right. Starlight Express had a set where the, the, the stage was half a cereal bowl. Like if you cut a cereal oh, bowl so in half. Was... So you'd enter from the rim and drop down onto the stage floor. And I saw the show many times. Many times people went, oops, didn't stop in time. And you're in the audience's lap. And then you do these races, right? And you, you were on ramps 60 feet off the ground. And a machine would bring the ramp to you that was going to connect stage left to stage right. And sometimes the ramp wasn't quite there. And you didn't know it till you were coming around the bend. And I saw a guy leap. About four feet. And miss the ramp. At six, no, he got it. But I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? And you have to do dialogue. Well, not during that, no. But I, I mean, serious accidents. Every time I saw so? that show, Andrea McArdle went into a steel beam, and the original Annie. She went into a steel beam. <laughs> I don't mean to. And I, I think she you was out cold. I, that's horrible. She that's was horrible. out that's cold. Horrible. That's horrible. Horrible. But it's so insane. So you didn't do it, or you did do it? Starlight Express. No, they showed me the rendering of the set, and I said, "Have a nice show." I well, you know, you I, got the wrong boy again, singer. I couldn't, I couldn't go up 70 feet like that. If my you... parents had destroyed me so much that I took a girl roller skating, and I heard in my head, don't ever heat. You know how I stop? When, when you were me, how you stop? A S wall. Snack bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. you just hit the snack bar every time, and you fall, and you look like an idiot. So you don't take yeah. anybody roller skating. No, of course Ice not. skating, how do you stop? Snack bar sure. or, or fall. So All right, so what are the dangerous jobs that, here we go. that here would are be? Here are the dangerous jobs. Uh, and I wonder, if there's, I wonder if there's even one that you and I could do if we had to. Lumberjack. That's a dangerous job because the oh trees fall on you. You're working with chainsaws and stuff all the time. Yeah, the, the opportunity to have something hit you, 
fall on you, Don't think kill I'm you. Four, your timber, timber. Even, even a minor woodpecker attack <laughs> could be horrible. <laughs> uh, but by the way, we have a woodpecker outside my bedroom. Window. Isn't that annoying? It's uh, worse than a rooster. Pre-dawn. And you go. What? And by the way, what's he comp? What is he trying what to get to? What is he doing? I know. When did they go? Enough. <laughs> I finished with this tree. Yeah, what this is, tree. I'm done. If anybody knows that, can you email us? When do they go? Yeah, I'm pretty. I've pretty much yeah. completed this tree. My work here is done. <laughs> And because yeah. it seems like it's never ending, I and know. they're showing off. They're yeah. showing off for other birds. Yeah. Look what I'm doing. I'm a carpenter. Yeah. Uh, underwater welder. This one I can't even talk. Underwater about. welder. So catch this. You go down below. You go into a tube, a half mile, yeah. and you're welding. Can you imagine that? So is the uh, water uh, in the tube? Yeah. There's water in the tube. Mm -hmm. So what I don't understand is how do you get a fire? They have underwater, underwater water because they have stuff that does that. And how by the way, how does that work? Some I don't know. Water I didn't do that much out fire. I didn't get an A in chemistry, but I know water puts out. But they they repair pipelines, ships, dams, all this stuff. Yeah. I, I can't I can't even imagine. Right. It. Um, sulfur miner. I didn't even know this. Sulfur miner. You know where they mine sulfur? Where they mine it? Volcanoes. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's a twofer. Yeah. You dive from the sulfur, <laughs> and it's uh oh, yeah. look what's what, something bubbling. Did you hear a bubble? Did somebody hear something? <laughs> um, ice road trucker. We've seen we've all sure. seen that show. That's, that's a TV that's a show. Sure. This one. Is, <laughs> It's similar to John getting shot out of the cannon because it's by choice yeah. and it's for entertainment. Yeah. Bull rider. Bull rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? That's a thing. Yeah. What is that about? What is that? By the way, it doesn't even be a bull. The horse is also a the thing. The bucking horse. But the bull rider thing, they use one hand. Right. Because two, why would you use two? You yeah. could actually hold on. One hand and the thing comes out, you irritate him, you let him out, and you manage to stay on. Hey, he stayed on long enough. Oh, then he got trampled. Right. Why? And by the way, you stay on for nine seconds. It's it, it's a chiropractic for the next twenty years. If you were the champion, and you did that for five years, I would guess you're three inches shorter, five inches shorter. Well, just from the bucking, uh, from course. the bucking, yeah, the bucking. And if my mother was yelling, "Get off that goddamn thing!" <laughs> about a skateboard. Look at Jason. <laughs> um, venom milker, and you know what? See, I they, think those, that's dangerous. They, they don't for like the to snake. be milked. They don't like to be. <laughs> they don't like to be. And you need a degree for this. And this is the best one. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. Crocodile physiologist. What? They actively capture and bring a crocodile out to study it, and then they have to release it. Back. So that's two times you're dealing with something that's going, no way, no friggin' way am I eating you. I'm eating you now. Can you imagine? I don't, the thing, have you ever been to the alligator shows that they- I hate them, I never go. No, they, they So we were in the out. Everglades one time, and you know, they brought you out on an airboat, you couldn't get away, so. <laughs> but apparently, you can hold the alligators Mouth open or closed? I can't remember. There's one direction where closed, they have closed, enough. Closed. closed. If it's yeah, closed, they don't have. Hey they Billy, hold open. the mouth open. Uh oh, Billy, <laughs> Billy, Billy. Uh, he got it wrong. He thought it was right the other here. direction. You gotta get yeah, it right. yeah, yeah, you gotta yeah. get that. Yeah, right. it's really yeah. important. Not a small, not a small detail. <laughs> Wait, they sent me. Yeah, they sent me out there for my first show. I couldn't remember. Close. Open or close. God <laughs> damn! I did it again. And I was a paying customer. And now he's fed, by the way. The good news we... So I actually, honestly, one of the things, I believe that everybody who does a dangerous job, we should have asked John this, is when he's flying across that thing, he must feel, I think these people that do the dangerous jobs, they feel like it's never going to happen to them, that they're some sort of a superhero. Well, I looked this up. Why people do dangerous jobs? Yeah. First of all, a lot of it has to do with poverty in a lot of places like Sherpa Guides and stuff like that, where you get paid sure. and can make a living. But the ones like the underwater welders and stuff, believe it or not, there's a, there, it, first of all, they get paid a lot. Second of all, their schedules are, are interesting because they can be off for two months and then work for two or three months. So it's you can spend yeah. time with the family, the life. He gets paid very well. But there's also this this sense of accomplishment that I've done something to make America safer. Sure. I've done a great job, whatever. Yeah. So that's a big part of this too. It all enters into that. So that's why they do it. You think that they do I it? I think there's a feeling that you know we all, in some sense, want to be feel a little bit like a superhero, like we have a superpower. And I'm sure when John is you know zinging across. <laughs> Like a superman. Singing across the thing for three seconds. For three seconds, he goes, well, I'm Superman. I'm flying. So to I that point, thing. what would your superpower be? If I could have one superpower? One superpower. Well, you know, I used to watch that show, Stan Lee's Superhumans, where he and this other guy would go around with people that they think that claim to have a superpower. Okay. And, and there were a lot of really good ones on that. I think if I could really, if I could have one superpower, I would want the power to change men's minds, people's minds. Mm. 
I think that would, you know, because I go, people are going to say flying. I go, I'm afraid of heights. And, and, but with my luck, the power runs out. I didn't know it had a, you know, it had a limit. So I'm at 80,000 feet in the fall. Other people say strength. Other people say invulnerability. But, but, and I go, no, no, no. I'd like to be able to change people's minds. Boy, mine seems so diminished next to that. What's yours? Spend as much as I want and, and magically eliminate debt. Yeah, it's kind of selfish compared to yours. <laughs> Guggenheim, Guggenheim, we're wrapping up. Let's see what uh, what he's David got. What Guggenheim. did we say wrong? What did we say right? What needs to be clarified? The number one thing, woodpeckers. Oh, why okay. do they pack? Yes. Why do they pack? Why do they pack? Why it's do they in pack? In order to find food, find food, excavate areas for nesting. They'll live in there sometimes. Oh, oh they and really mark they're hollering their territory. At... Wow. Wow. And what the yes. territory? Yes, they... I actually had one that that. And mark their territory. And mark the territory. The I actually had a woodpecker. Yeah, I had a woodpecker that lived above, above my car until they. Right, we're not interested. Okay, what else? Is, we there, got? is there anything? <laughs> but David, does it say anything? Like, is it a Thank mating you. thing too? Like, the louder yeah. the knocking, the more the female woodpecker. Go, oh, that guy can. He can really drill. That's it. Uh, no, that's just showing I, off. I don't see any. Nothing about mating. Okay, that's showing off, Jason. That's a woodpecker not a, going. Not a watch this. Watch yeah. this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's noise. Okay. I'm up what else? Woodpecker. Sure. Well, 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 one of the interesting things is <laughs> how far back do you think clowning goes in history? Well, the according to Mel man. Brooks, <laughs> <laughs> Paleolithical man, Cemeteris uh, man. I don't yeah. know. There was a guy, you know, Hog, and they Hog got one and bombed. He, and bombed he would trip over a log. It was hysterical. They actually found a, a, a thing of ice that melted, and under there was a guy holding a ball and had a red nose. And he was balancing a stick on his nose. Yeah. Go ahead. How old? Well, well you're actually not, you're not far off. Ancient Egypt, uh, there are hier hieroglyphics that show... Um, wow clowning and uh, they were actually called dangus and they were compelled <laughs> to wear funny masks and entertain the pharaohs can so i just say something um, was, it a vol was it a voluntary job david or was it was it like <laughs> sort of slave so. and then dangus how did, was it that was that the hierarchy I think they, they were <laughs> They were African pygmies, so I don't think this was something that you volunteered. Yeah, and yeah, David, yeah. This, may I just yeah. insert this? Because I've been on radio for so long, and just as a precautionary, <laughs> could you also Google yeah. dingus to make sure that we're not <laughs> cursing <laughs> inadvertently every three minutes? Dangus. 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 Well, either dangus. way, it sounds to okay. me dangus. like a body part okay. in a porn movie. So I just want to make sure that when we're throwing around the term dangus, that we're not yeah. saying... By the way, also <laughs> funny, if that's the... Because uh, we'll definitely. find out in the Philippines, that yeah. means, and we're shut down. So, yeah, yeah if you could. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, actually, Peter, I'm glad you mentioned that because, again, clowning historically goes back to a lot of different uh, cultures. Does uh, it? Ancient China, the the, Zhang, the Zhao dynasty. Right. In fact, the Great Wall of China would have been painted if not for the emperor's clown. The clown Wait, stopped what, what, the what? painting job? What? I don't understand that. <laughs> yes. What, what was in it for the, the clown to the not emperor, paint the wall? The emperor was... Well, the emperor was going to paint the wall, and this probably would have meant thousands of hundreds or thousands of people dying from from that endeavor because it was so huge. Sure. But the clown, the, the court jester, if you will, was the only one who was able to make the emperor think maybe this isn't such a good idea, and he didn't do it. What do you suppose that comedy routine was? I don't know. So is it this emperor? Two guys go out to paint a wall. <laughs> and the other question I wanted to know is, what, what Sherwin-Williams color were they going to paint yeah, that wall? Right. Like, where do you get enough Egg paint? Eggshell. Eggshell. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, so, it's yeah. everlasting. Yeah, absolutely. Everlasting. Wow. No, always classy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, the, so clowns were, were way back. But guess what? One clown is no longer uh, performing. Well, I'm sure there's more Ronald than one. McDonald. Clown. Ronald McDonald. Ronald oh. McDonald no longer with us. Why? Ronald <laughs> McDonald. They That's right. retired. He was retired. Retired in uh, 2016. Uh -huh. um, there were a lot of different reasons, but a lot of it had to do with the the Stephen King it's, you know, you those go. sorts sure of scary clowns. Yes. There are also incidences all across the country of a violent clown. You know, people would videotape clowns uh, 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 menacing people, sometimes even with weapons. Uh, this was a documented thing. And so in 2016, he was retired. Can you see, by the way, I just would love to see video of Ronald in the full makeup going, <laughs> Let me go. Let me go. I got a mortgage. Got a Take the hamburger. Leave me. Yeah. You know, another famous client yeah. that was retired, one of my fam favorite bits on Seinfeld. One of my favorites. 
And it was played by the great John Favreau, John Favreau, who went on to you know, direct Iron Man, become a major Hollywood director and actor. But he played a, a party clown at a kid's party that George is in attendance at. It's the one where eventually there would be a, a kitchen fire and I would push old women and children out of the way to escape. But it, drew, it drove George crazy that this clown didn't know who Bozo was was and i kept haranguing him about you don't know bozo how do you not know bozo and john had a line and he did it so perfectly he went i don't know bozo man you hung up on some clown from the 60s man <laughs> he did it so beautifully i never got through the scene and he was in it he was in up. it well, yeah, I thank there. you, Guggenheim. I thank John Weiss. I thank all our guests. Laurie and by Krimi, the way, thank you, Blue Wire Studios here in Las Vegas. And anybody who's uh, still a dangus, we apologize. <laughs> yes. Um, Jay, good job, I think. <laughs> yes, and you know what? We got away with it unscathed. And by the way, good coffee. <laughs> oh, you bastard. <laughs> good night, everybody. Drive safely, dangus.